A warm welcome to another edition of the Magpie Circle and continuing the theme with some of Notts' more recent younger players uh, that came through our system after um, a very illuminating and a very revealing one-on-one -on -one with Greg Tempest. One of um, Greg's teammates uh, from that era who attracted an awful lot of attention was actually linked with Manchester United during his time at Notts. Um, young goalkeeper who are delighted to say is joining us today. Uh, Fabian Spies. Fabian, how are you, my friend? I'm very well. Thanks for having me, Paul. No, delight, delighted to have you on board. We're just looking at the shirt behind you there, number 23. Yeah. Um, that, was, that was a shirt that um, brings back happy memories, doesn't it? It certainly does. 2 0 win at Fratton Park on a cold Tuesday night. <laughs> okay. Clean sheet, eh? Clean sheet. Yeah, it was a big one, to be honest with me, obviously. I mean, first full debut, um, that was. And, yeah, I mean, Bratton Park, it doesn't get much bigger than that. I think there was over 10,000 people there at the time. And, uh, I mean, <laughs> talk about being nervous. And it was a cold, wet, windy night. It was horrendous in terms of conditions. And I was just like, I just need to get through this game. And, obviously, we ended up winning. A, it was a great game. So, um, I mean, that... I was chuffed, to be honest. Couldn't be happy at the time. Excellent. Well, look, we're going to delve into your appearances for Knots, the stories behind the bubble. I've tried to get as many goalkeeping shirts as I could lay my hands on in my collection. So this would have been, not the actual shirt, but this would have been the colour of the shirt when you made your debut, I believe. Um, right on the back, the Steve Mildenhall, for those of you of the Jurassic era, you remember him. And I think he, went, he, he was with you at Bristol Rovers a bit, wasn't he? That's right, yeah. I was there for a short loan period um, and I think, well, Steve Milner was injured at the time, so I sort of came in to replace him. Very good. And then, and more recently, uh, Adam Collin uh, and uh, Fitzsimons as FA Cup one. So that's about all the goalkeeping jerseys I've got for Knots. So, um, right, let's, let, let, let's dive in. Um, your arrival um, at um, Knots was probably different um, to many people. You had quite, um, I guess, a cosmopolitan and, 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 and globe-trotting uh, early part of your life before you arrived at Meadow Lane, correct? That's right, yeah. So, um, I mean, I was obviously originally born in Germany, but at a young age, um, went to Dubai with my family. Um, parents got divorced and went um, to Spain to live with my family. And that's really where I started um well went to spain to live with my uh, grandparents there and my mum we all moved at the same time and that's really where i started playing football and um enjoying the game um a couple of years there went back to dubai hmm. um, if you could just pause on the spain one because when yeah. you did a little project for me is, mm -hmm. isn't it the case that um were real madrid taking a look at you and were you more of an outfield player or, you know <laughs> sort of this under 15 under 16 scouts and everything yeah, I mean, I was, how old was I in Spain? It's probably, I was probably about between 10 and 14, that age I was at. And um, I was originally an outfield player, um, sort of a winger trying to take on people and thinking I can score goals. But um, there was a training session where the goalkeeper got injured. I mean, and bear in mind, this is just a um, sort of a Sunday league thing, you know, no big club or anything, local club. Um, but it's actually the club where Isco came through. I don't know, he plays for yeah. Spain and Real Madrid, big, big player. He came through um, the same club. And um, yeah, I was sort of playing outfield. Goalkeeper got injured and I just went in goal. Um, and my stepdad, he was a, a goalkeeper, didn't play at a high level or anything, but he really sort of wanted me to get into being a goalkeeper. So I ever, ever since, I, I stayed, um, stayed as a goalkeeper and really quite quickly made progression um, and improved and then there was sort of clubs coming to look at me I mean there was a time when Espanyol wanted me to fly up and um, do a trial there at the time I said no because I was only 14 and I would have had to you know live in a sort of like a digs or a how do you call it if, um, a school where you stay a boarding school and you know for me at the time my parents or my mum was like you know I don't think that's the right thing to go and learn Catalan at that age and, and move halfway across Spain Real Madrid, they were sort of taking a look as well. And I was playing within the selection um, of Andalusia, which was, you know, um, the best players from the region came together. Um, but then it all sort of stopped because we moved to Dubai, basically. So, um, <laughs> yeah. 
it came to a to a to a halt. I just had to leave everything, and um, yeah, we parents. My mum was then with my stepfather now, and we we moved to Dubai, and that's then when another journey sort of started. Okay, so Dubai is probably not a footballing hotbed. So so how, so how did it progress from there? Correct. So um, I mean, I was playing some with some amateur. I mean, at the time, Mick Leonard was there. So um, okay. Mick Leonard, obviously, he was. Uh, well, later on, went to take the youth team and, and start up the academy again for knots. But um, at the time, yeah, I just I was playing way below my level, really, um, yeah. with some kids. I had to play amateur men's football, so I was playing with um, older older players as well in the evening. Sometimes just to try and improve as a player, really. I was in an academy at the time with. Um, um, Carlton Palmer, so he was running a, a football academy uh, okay. back then in Dubai um, and was doing really well and back then there was then interest from Everton basically so we, they wanted me to to go and do a trial at Everton which I did. Um, Mick had taken me on a few sessions as well at the time and basically it came down to making a decision. I went on trial to Everton and they were sort of thinking you know we like you we're going to make a decision by May and then the other offer on the table was uh, Notts County so I'd um, actually done a few trials with Notts County prior to them opening the academy um, and was training with with Pilks when he was still um, the goalkeeper at the club uh, I think it was Russell Holt if I'm not mistaken yeah. was there as well so I was training with the first team bear in mind I was only 15 years old so um, it then came down to sort of making a decision do I go to Notts County or do I wait for Everton and the sort of motto that we had at the time was if you're good enough you'll make it um so you know i did really like my time at knots and it was somewhere where i could see myself growing and improving and hopefully getting um some first team football so i ended up going down that route okay so you are then effectively uprooting again from dubai yeah to move to nottingham yeah so is that something you do on your own or family involved or you just get digs placed by the club and everything no, so um, at the time, my stepfather had lost his job as well, and he was looking to come to the UK as well. Um, so it kind of all happened at the same time, which was good for me, because I think it would have been very difficult to to come to the UK by myself, having my parents still over in Dubai. Um, when I came over, I stayed in Digs, so my mum and stepfather and my sister, they moved to Stoke, which is obviously not too far away, which was good. Um, and I stayed in Diggs um, in Nottingham throughout the so What week. age would you be? What, you'd be 16 at this point, 15? Yeah, 16, yeah. So it was still, for me, it was still quite a big jump. Um, the first Diggs was pretty difficult for me because I was sort of coming into a dressing room or, or a, the youth team didn't really know anyone um, from mm. the lower ages. I wasn't a Nottingham boy. Um, different bit of a culture shock basically I was living in, in, in Clifton um, not to say anything bad about Clifton but it's obviously very <laughs> Goodbye to Clifton I <laughs> it was very different and um, Chris who I was living with at the time he had a girlfriend so in the, as soon as we got home he would always go and see his, his girlfriend and I was pretty much in the room most evenings by myself just uh, trying to pass time waiting until the next day and until the weekend came so uh, it was quite a difficult time but um, managed to get through that so, so who was in the group then? You know, so, so was Greg the same year and Kyle Dixon and those kind of guys? Yeah, so Greg was the same age as me. Hayden was a year older. Uh, Curtis was the same year as me. Um, Nathan Fox was a year older than me. Lewis Williamson, Liam Mitchell were a year older. Um, so there's quite a few. Lewis Whiteley. There's, yeah, quite a few players in the older groups. And from my group, it was sort of, yeah, it was me, Greg. Curtis, Jake Woley, um, I think there was one or two more, I can't remember, and then Carl Dixon was a younger uh, afterwards, so when we were second years, Carl was in the first year. So just to put this into context, where, where was this around the time of Munto? Was this before, after? So this was after Munto. Um, okay. The first time I came on trial at Knott's was sort of in and around the Munto era. So I remember actually um seeing Sven and, and Mick introduced me to him as well, I think, and um saying hello. And and that's obviously the project that was going on at Knotts County. And one of the reasons I said, you know, this would be great for me is because yeah. it was that era where right the club is going in one direction and <laughs> obviously then pretty quickly it changed. Yeah. 
but um, yeah, they still managed to have some great times, obviously. And it was the right decision in my view because I still ended up getting to where I wanted to. So did you have much interaction with Casper at that point? Yeah, so I trained with Casper. Um, great guy, I remember. <laughs> just funny you see you get really angry sometimes in the training sessions he just boot ball and at the at the time we were sort of training at the um, at high fields which yeah. is next to the train track as well so you know, yeah. there'd be plenty of balls which just went over the rail, railway which we couldn't get back because you just boot them and uh, yeah I mean great guy to learn off obviously he's, he's been incredible what he's achieved um, so yeah I mean for, for me as a young I, I was 15 at the time as well training with him um, it's just brilliant was he a tough taskmaster as a goalkeeper with you or just very cooperative? Um, I can't really remember him giving me that much advice. I think he was just very focused on what he was doing. Um, always remember he's just got this way of catching the ball where it was incredible. It's like a Danish catch and they just catch it like that rather than sort of bringing it in like that. It's like that. And never managed to get hang of that technique. But um, yeah. Uh, he never really spoke much. I didn't, I didn't have that many training sessions. There's probably a handful that I could count. Um, but obviously, you learn how they approach training, and you know, very motivated in that sense. So, um, learned a lot from him, even the short amount of training sessions we had. So, so at that point, would you have been in the crowd for those home games with the Munto era and everything? No, because basically, um, I was obviously fly. I was in Dubai. I was still living in Dubai at the time, and then. When I, I came on trial, I think it was twice overall. Right. So that's when I had those training sessions with Casper. Gotcha. As soon as I signed with the youth team, the Munto era was over, yeah. basically. So, it was so, so, so you've signed. Uh, Sven's come and gone. Casper's come and gone. Um, so, 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 so what was it like? What was it like? It was... It was I would, honestly, my first year in the youth team was difficult because... Um, again, I come into a new environment. I'd always been a very sort of academic boy in school, and yep. you know, I like, like, say, like school, but I did enjoy it. Um, and then you come all of a sudden into a full time football environment, which is completely different in a country where you don't really know anyone, you're living with a host family. And basically, all it was in the first year of the youth team was, you know, waking up go to training, do the jobs at the club, come back at 5, 6 p.m., um, have your dinner, go in your room, wake up the next day, basically. That's how the year, the whole year was almost um, like that for the first year. So it was, the first year was tougher even because I didn't really play in the first year because Liam Mitchell was ahead of me and he was actually doing um, doing well at the time as this well. This was Liam Mitchell, big lad, big, strong. Yes, yeah, correct, yeah. So he was doing really well as well in, in the youth team and... First year was it was difficult for me to get any um, any playing time, and then the second year changed quite dramatically because Liam, I think, was offered a first year pro, uh, if I remember correctly, and then I was getting more regular game time. I actually moved digs um, with um, Josh Marshall and um, Jonathan Boyer, so they were other lads, and they didn't make the first team, but I felt much more comfortable in that environment because it was four or five of us in the in the digs and it was just a much more enjoyable experience we'd go out and do you know sometimes some things in the evening and you know just have a wander around town or whatever which in the first year I didn't really do that much. Greg Tempest when he did his excellent piece um, he said that one of the most terrifying nerve-wracking experiences of his life uh, was on a daily basis having to knock on Martin Allen's door and clean his office out and clean his shoes. Um, so what? So what? What inverted commas jobs were, were, were you allocated to do and interact with those senior first team players? Yeah, so I had the first team dressing room. So um, that was a, a, he mentioned in the interview, didn't he? Knocking on the first team dressing room door as well and going in there and. Um, yeah, it was no different for me. I mean, you go in there and it's a little bit of a surreal environment because on a Saturday you see the guys playing, obviously, and like, wow, it's, it, you're going into a dressing room cleaning people's boots. Obviously, everyone had their own players' boots as well, so you had to do that. But, um, yeah, you're in the dressing room. <laughs> everyone's getting showered and you're sort of wandering around trying to pick up things and, and cleaning the dressing room. You're 
hoovering and mopping and then someone's walking through and just made it dirty and you dare not say anything. Um, that's, that's sort of how it was. But I think those jobs and, and it was just, we hated it at the time, but it was so necessary. It was so necessary for our discipline to, to do that. Um, I've spoken to several players, you know, and, and legends of the club, Mark Draper would explain how, you know, exactly the same shoes that you were in. Um, he was looking after the dressing room and he said it was terrifying to walk in with a tray of tea and you would have characters like, um, and he's a big listener and, and watches the show, Rashid Harkook, uh, Brian Kilcline, you know, and, and he said it was very, very intimidating. And he literally took the tea in and tried to get out physically as quickly as he could before there was all sorts of batterings going on in, you know, I don't talk physically, but you know, the banter would be coming in and you'd need to be on your toes. And like you say, you can't answer back, can you? That'd be the worst possible thing to do. Exactly. I mean, I remember going in the dressing room once and there was, like, you see these black bits on the floor and I'm like, what, what's this? Like, what am I having to clean here? And then you, you realize, and it's a, it's a burnt shirt. Someone had burnt a shirt. <laughs> I, think it was, I think it was Hughesy. I think he, he burnt it. It wasn't a nut shirt, but he burnt someone's shirt. It must have been Wolverhampton. It must have been a golden black one. It must, it must have been the black bits off the trim of the wolf shirt. It must have been. <laughs> I can't remember what shirt it was, but it was just bits of black around on the floor. And I was like, wow. Because the banter, like, that's part of the dressing room, obviously. And sometimes... I mean, in my experience, it can go sometimes a little bit too far, but it's part and parcel of football as well, isn't it? So, um, I mean, when I was in the youth team, I remember coming in and all my clothes were hung up on the um, on the ceiling, all ice put in my socks, and <laughs> we, we, yeah, there were some stories as well. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, uh, the, the initiations, but I think as we set talk with Greg, it's a very hierarchical world, you know apprentices as I call them, YTs, scholars, whatever it is. It's the same principle, senior pros and there. And you know, there's that big gap. One game, which we'll come on to a minute and you get into there, but <laughs> it's, a, it's a big chasm. I remember when I was at Leicester, um, there's a young YT there and he had to look after the referees on match day, take the tea in and all the rest of it. And this is Premier League and Uriah Rennie was the referee, you know, big name ref. Yeah, yeah. The little lad's gone in with the tea for Uriah Rennie. And your eyes turned around to the to the little, to the sixteen year old Knox apprentice. He said, "Stay in this room. You're not leaving. <laughs> Stay in this room." He says, "I'm not allowing you to leave until you tell me a joke." <laughs> and I, he says, "He's sixteen year old." And he's like, oh, 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 oh. And he's like, "Frozen. You're not leaving. You should stay. Do you do not step out that door until you have told me a joke." So fair play to the young lad. Mm -hmm. The young lads. Oh, you know, doing only funny stories, you know. You know, if you if you want a funny story, it's probably going to be your performance today. <laughs> that, and Uriah's not taking it very well. Don't you question me? Blah blah blah. Get out. You know. And of course, the apprentice tells the story very well later. I'm sure he remembers it to this day. But at the time, he was really petrified. Absolutely yeah. petrified. Of course, yeah. And it, it and it's, that's the thing, isn't it? You see the players playing on a match day and, and it's what you aspire to do. It's what you work from a young age to try and achieve. And there you are then cleaning those people's boots and, you know, doing things for them and sometimes in and around that environment, which you've always looked up to. So it's very surreal in that sense. D did you interact much with Martin? Because Martin would have been the manager at that point in those early days, very early days for you. Yeah, so Martin Allen was, um, I was still in the youth team, obviously, at the time. I actually loved Martin Allen. He was a, like a real, he had, his, he had his moments in terms of, I mean, he made us run all the stands at the end of the season. I don't know if, if anyone's told that story. No, go on, what's that? So at the end of the youth team season, basically, we had to, um, he had this stand run, basically. So it was, yeah, the, the, I think it's a Derek Paver stand, isn't it? Yep. Uh, you had to run up it, come back down, do every second step running up, and you had to hop it with your right foot, hop it with your left foot, and then you had to do every second step running up. And this was once the season had ended, basically, and all the senior pros had they'd gone home uh, for the summer break, and we were left there two or three weeks afterwards to do this sort of training camp that he'd um, like a think, boot camp yeah just I think more than anything it was a mental test he wanted to see who's ready to to graft 
Um, so once we'd done the stand, you then had to do 100 press-ups, um, 100 sit-ups, and then you had to go into the dressing room and then do some other exercises as well. So basically the plan was over three weeks to gradually increase this. Yeah. So the first week we did that all of that. And I was like, I, there's no way I can do three sets of this. Because what by the end of the three weeks, he wanted us to do three sets. But gradually, you know, we did a week of the one. So it was every second day we came in, I think. We did the, you know, so that one set. And the second time, the second week, we had to do two sets. And the third week, we had to do three sets. So three times we had to do what I just described. And there was, I think Greg was actually sick um, <laughs> doing that. And I mean, I couldn't actually... On the third set on the last week, I couldn't get up the <laughs> couldn't get up the last stairs of the stands. It was two lads having to hold me because my legs had just they'd completely gone. They were wobbly. Um, it was the hardest thing I think I've ever done in my life, to be honest, Paul. Um, and then after we did the stands, we had to go in the dressing room and he put all the showers on. There's steam everywhere. We're doing these exercises, sweating, and he got all the actual staff at the club as well. Put on music through the um, through the stereo so obviously out in match day so similar to that and all the, the staff were just clapping it, it was again it was crazy but again he was testing us mentally basically um, seeing you know who has what it takes to to become a professional footballer too much sounds like something out of that which I love watching that SAS trials program with Ant Middleton and, and the SAS boys doesn't it you know it's a repetitive physically demanding but also very very mental strength that is needed not to capitulate not to stop absolutely and, and by week one like i say i was like, i have no idea how i'm going to do three sets this is impossible and in the end we all managed to to more or less do it so um you know it shows you how when you put in the work you can achieve what you want to achieve basically and i think that's what he was trying to to teach us as well i mean for people i mean i've done i've not done all of that but I have run up and down the stand many times, you know, part of my rehab as, you know, as, as the Sunday morning amateur footballer in his late 40s, uh, the fizz, Johnny Wilson. I think he's a top guy, yeah. top guy. And he would have me doing that. Mm. I used to do, have to do it three, not, not on one leg or anything like that. I had to do it three times. So you, you, were, you were 17, I was about 47. <laughs> Absolute killer. Just getting up the floor and your calves are killing and Alan Shearer talks about how he came back from a knee injury at um, Blackburn when he used mm -hmm. to have to run up and down the stand 10, 15 times and said incredibly, it doesn't sound much, incredibly difficult repetitions to do. Yeah. I think Johnny Wilson has got it from that when we were did it because Johnny Wilson was a physio at the time. Um, but there were so many things Martin Allen made us do. I mean, we were cl we were clearing pitches worth of snow in the freezing cold on a 3G for a friendly game. <sighs> you know, we were hours out there trying to just clear this. It must have been, I mean, at least 10 centimetres or more of snow of the pitch. And we're <laughs> all the youth team trying to clear the snow of the training pitch as well. Uh, he was very much about that, that mentality and, you know, what have you got what it takes. I remember at the time... So I was in the youth team and I was doing really well. And I went on loan to, um, to lose. So lose is down in Brighton, Paul. <laughs> lose. Yeah, no, yeah, no. I've, I've, I was thinking lose. I mean, hang on. Is it, does he mean to lose or something? But lose. Yeah, L -E -W -E -S. Lewis. 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 Where is it? Lose down, down on that South Sussex coast somewhere. Yeah. Exactly. So me and George at the time, who was another um, apprentice. So we went out on loan there. So basically, here's me and George, midweek game, driving four hours down south. George was living in, George had family in London. So we, we do two hours to London, have some lunch there, and then go do the rest of the trek, play an evening game. So eight o'clock, quarter eight kickoff, finish at 11 o'clock, four hours back in the middle of the evening. It was, it was dangerous when we think back I'm about it. to say, absolutely. The game. And then on the next day, we had college at eight, nine o'clock in the morning. And <laughs> again, I think he did that to try and test us. Um, I don't really have any other explanation for it. And then I, I got injured. I, I sort of had a hand injury, perhaps played on it a little bit. I mean, I, I was injured, um, but, you know... <laughs> I was like, this. I can't keep doing this journey. It's it's dangerous going down there in the middle of the night and driving back up. And um, I remember we were driving back once and there was a guy next to me who was swerving all over the place. And we are like, this is us in a minute. 
So, um, yeah, experience so, with Martin Allen. As is, uh, so who would have been your youth team coach at that point? So I had Michael Johnson, and then it was Brett Adams, I think, afterwards. Okay. So, um, as sadly has been the case at Notts for the best part of two decades now, a very high turnover of managers. Um, mm. So Martin moved on. Um, Keith Curl came in. And so it would have been Keith. He came in before, didn't he? Chris Kwame yeah, was in before. Chris yes, yes. Um, Keith, Keith Curl, he got me thinking. Keith Curl took over from Martin Allen. And it would have been Keith Curl. That but gave Keith Curl took over from Chris, didn't he? No. Oh. I'm hoping I've got this right, otherwise it'd be a big faux pas. <laughs> Keith Curl took, took over. From Martin Allen. Keith mm -hmm. Curl had a year and Chris Kiwamia right. took over. Correct. And Sorry. Keith yes. Curl. The reason I know that is because Keith Curl was spotted in an executive box watching the games from the back of that, you know, the, the one end of the Knots ground while Martin was still uh, in charge. And yeah. so he kind of knew his number was going to be up, i.e., that. That had already been set up. Yeah. Um, so Keith Curl's taken over. Um, and he did well initially. Mm. Didn't do badly at all, full stop, in terms of results. Um, but he gave you your debut then, yeah? At the, right at the end of the season against, I believe it was Colchester. And you came on for the last few minutes. What, what was the build-up and what happened around that? Yeah, so, I mean, at the time I was being linked with... Um, Man United, Arsenal, these sorts of clubs. I don't know whether it was just rumours or whether there was actually any truth in it. I know Arsenal did come to watch one of the games and I think Man U did later down the line come and watch a crew game as well because Ray True told me that. Um, so there must have been something in it. Um, but basically, I think they wanted to see me in a first-team environment uh, and playing with the first team. Now, I was hoping to play the full 90 minutes, which... Um, didn't happen in the end, obviously, but um, I think they just wanted to sort of see, let's put him in, you know, obviously as we were 4-0 up, they said, right, you know, nothing to lose here, so we might as well just put him in. So um, they gave me, obviously, I think it was last 10, 15 minutes of the game, yeah. unfortunately conceded, but um, yeah, it was a great experience, obviously, to come in, uh, come play at Meadow Lane and, you know, have me debut, and obviously from there on it, it sort of, Everything you did only set, what seventeen at that point? Just turned eighteen. Just so turned I mean, eighteen. Yeah, yeah. Um, which is very young for a goalkeeper, isn't it? It's one thing for a, for an outfield player, but that's very young for a goalkeeper to be in the press. And of course, this was League One, not League Two. Yeah, yeah, that's right. It was very, very young when I look back, and I think, wow, maybe they maybe they were eighteen. You know, not many goalkeepers can say that. To be honest, most sort of go into the non-league first or, I mean, Premier League, they come to the lower league. So I was like, wow, this is, you know, a real shot. And um, yeah, it was obviously, you know, from there on then, obviously we had the pre-season then and I was then coming in as a first team player. So I was offered my pro contract. Yeah. Um, with Keith Curl again, who I really, really liked as a manager. But um, then going into my actual full debut, I do remember, um, but obviously he had an injury against Leighton Orient. He got concussion. And I do remember Keith Kill being on the sideline. It's like, he's not coming off. He, no, nope, he's not coming off. <laughs> and I was looking there. I was looking along the side of like, okay, so you really trust me. <laughs> but um, yeah, obviously then Bart did have to come off and I came in and um, actually probably made one of the best saves I've ever made from that free kick with the deflection. Um, I was just so pumped, Paul. I just had so much energy and so much adrenaline. That's the only way I can explain um, that save and, and the performance really to a certain extent. Um, so, Portsmouth, we touched upon it earlier, was your full, what, full 90 minutes, correct? Yeah, so that was after Leighton Orient, yeah. Yes, that's right. So, you had a taste of it. Um, you've signed a pro contract. As you've mentioned, right from a very early age, you know, they're, they're constant. 
but there were reg there were regular little snippets in the national media and you know uh, Manchester United are following. And so for Knox, the Knox fan base are thinking, crikey, you know, we've we've got a real, real, real hot property on our hands here. I yeah. mean, I don't know whether you had a good agent or not, or you know, or like you say, there was concrete scouting, but it seemed to sort of appear because a lot of the times you get scouted and nothing ever materializes or appears, does it? But but it was it was kind of played out in the media to an to an extent. I mean, so how does that make you? Did you did you get a lot of flack in the dressing room saying he often man you or this sort of stuff? Or how, how did it all play out? Well I remember being in the youth team actually and um going for a training session, coming back and Bob the cleaner, I don't know if you know Bob, but Bob was the cleaner at the time. He goes, he says, Fabs, have you seen the newspaper? I'm like, no, why? What's up? Yeah, have a look at this. So I picked up the Sun newspaper, okay, but um, you know, pick it up. And then this top right hand corner, there's this little snippet Alex Ferguson looking at Fabian Spees. And I was like, where's this come from? Like, I didn't know anything about this at the time. So this was before I'd obviously made my, my debut and played. So I was just completely baffled. I still don't know whether it was the club just trying to create a little bit of media around me or whether it was... Did you have an agent at the time? Um, did I have an agent? No, not really. Um, didn't have an agent when I was in, that, in the youth team. After that, I ended up getting one because, I, okay, well, maybe they, I do need someone here to advise me or to help me. Um, but really, in the youth team, you, you don't really need an agent, to be honest, because... Um, yeah, it's just a natural progression into the first team. And then, unless you're obviously in the Premier League, then they do get agents far far too young, in my opinion. But, um, yeah, no, I, so I was completely surprised by that. And then moving forward with the interest, obviously that really gave me a boost of confidence. I was like, OK, so I've got a real shot here. And at the time, I was oozing with confidence, even just made my debut at 18, signed my first year pro, training with the first team, pre-season, played a few games. And I was like, wow, OK, Got a real shot to have a good career here in football. So what happened? What happened? Uh, good question. So, I mean, at the time when Keith Kerr was the manager, um, so I played against Leighton Orient, did really well, made my de full debut at Fratton Park. We won 2-0. And we lost against Hartlepool and Stevenage. I can't remember having bad games but I can't remember having great games either so it's probably one of those and then I remember playing against Crew, where we drew 1-1 where I got man of the match at Meadow Lane as well um, and did really well and that's when Ray Drew came to me um, afterwards and at the time we were doing again pretty well um, and then I was sort of you know I was let go out of the team basically. Bart was back fit again and I was I was dropped. And at that time, to be honest, I accepted it. I said, you know, okay, I would have liked to have kept playing, but Bart's obviously a phenomenal, phenomenal goalkeeper. So I understand why they would put him back in. At the same time, I was a little bit like, well, you know, I'm a young player, I've got a lot to give. And, you know, sometimes it's nice for, for the, the club to trust you and say, right, we're going to stick with him and, and build him up which is what I saw myself as a bit of a project to, you know, to grow with the club. Um, but anyway, I, I mean, I didn't have anything. I was like, okay, that's fine. You know, Bart came back in. And then really it was, it was a lack of games, to be honest, Paul. I wasn't playing regularly. We didn't really have an under-23 side. Um, came in here and there again. Um, and I can't really remember when it was, but I signed a new contract with the club anyways, which was great because I was still in the... I was still like, well, you know, I'm, I'm 18, 19, playing with the first team, playing the odd game and the trophies and so on. And still, for me, it's great where position where I'm at. Um, and yeah, then it changed pretty quickly um, when, I mean, I remember then I played against, well, Keith Kill got sacked, um, first and foremost, and then Chris came in. Yeah. So when Chris came in, I saw this as a, as a real opportunity for me to, to kick on because he was the under 23s manager or under 21s. Yep. He, he'd seen me play. He knew what I, what, what I was about. Um, and I had that great game against Wolves in the Johnson's paint trophy. Yeah. And, and penalty shootout, wasn't it? Yes. Yeah. So obviously we won on penalties, which for me, it was great. I had all my family watching in Spain. So for me, that was like, I genuinely thought we would win the Johnson's paint trophy, Paul. I was like, 
this is my shot. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to win the Johnson's Payne Trophy with knots. I want to kind of put you in there, like, like the, uh, you know, Manchester City. Even you know, they they put the number two keeper in on a cup run, don't they? You know, yeah. play him each cup, and so clearly the incentive for you is get through to the next round. I've got another game. Yeah, exactly. And and, and at the time the game was on TV, so my my family in Spain could watch, and my grandparents would watch, and I was like, for me that was real pride because we won and I played really well, and I was like. You know, this is this is this is great. So I wanted to get to the next round. So hopefully there'll be another TV uh, tie yeah. so they could see me watch me again. Um, obviously, then what happened was Chris got sacked before the next round, and Sean Derry came in. Okay. So the first game I had with with Sean Derry was the Oldham game where we lost, which was the next round of the. It was a heavy defeat. Five. Five one. Yeah. Again, don't really recall playing particularly bad in any way. I, I look back at the goal since and I was like, you know, I can't really do much about them. It's just a, a pretty poor team effort. But for me, that was like a pivotal moment because ever since then, that was, I sort of, again, approached it as Sean Derry's come in. It's again, for me, another chance to impress him to try and get ahead of Bar. And I was like, you know, right, this is my opportunity. As soon as that game went, I put so much pressure on myself in that game because I was like, you know, I really want to do well in this competition and get further. And we'd obviously had a heavy defeat. And ever since then, I felt like I was playing catch up. I was like, the first impression he's got of me is not good. And I really, at that point, then started to struggle with my, my confidence, basically. Again, I wasn't playing regular football. And it sort of went pretty pretty quickly downhill. I remember after the, after the game, I was crying in the dressing room. I do remember Sean looking at me and I think like, He's, I sort of sensed a, a weakness, perhaps, in me. Maybe I, that was wrong with me, but I sort of felt like, you know, he's not strong enough or he's, he's got a weak character almost. That's kind of the feeling that, that I got. Because obviously, Sean, uh, I have listened to the interview that he had and he's very much in another era, basically, wasn't he? He was, you know, it was all about um, the sort of tough guys and um, you know battling through every single thing and at the time men didn't really speak about their emotions I suppose so I don't know whether that was then transferred over to him as a, as a coach as well but for me that I was playing catch up so really difficult for me ever since I put so much So pressure. who was the first choice keeper ordinarily at that point when Sean came in? Who, who was it did you say so? Yeah was it Bart or was it Roy at that point? I think it might have been Roy actually. Yeah, then, wasn't I, it? I, I, I think he got Roy. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, you're probably right. Actually, it's, it's like the, the time yeah. difficult to remember. Bart but. had gone in the summer, hadn't he? Because somehow or other, we managed, despite the fact he went to a significantly higher club with a significantly bigger budget, and he was under contract and a very good goalkeeper. We somehow managed not to get a transfer fee for him. There's another classic case of not some, you know, yeah. transfer negotiations. And, 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 and he, then, he, he then left, yeah. I remember at the time he was, he was still in pre-season when Sean was there, if I'm not mistaken. And I remember there being the talk about it and, you know, it was just all stalling basically. And I was like, okay, this is Bart's going. It's for me again, another opportunity to, to come in and, and do really well because I think when Sean came was towards the end of the season, if I'm not mistaken, right? It was, there wasn't that much. Um, I thought he came, it was the great escape, wasn't it? Yeah, it the great escape. So, I he, he, he probably came in about November time, he probably came in about November time. Was it that okay? Mm. Time flies so well um... because if you remember under Chris, it's always going to be um, very difficult, mm. you know. It was seen, it was seen as an inverted commas cost cutting exercise by many fans to promote the youth team coach. Yeah. Um, and clearly, I think Chris was under a lot of pressure to start quite well. Yeah. And it didn't, it didn't work out. And so he was, yeah, Mick Jones was with him, if, if you remember as well. They were instantly under a lot of pressure. Uh, and so you would have had at that point. I believe uh, you would have had Callum McGregor and Jack Grealish coming in on loan. Callum was first, and then in Jack. Yeah. Did you interact much with those guys? You know, not a dissimilar age. And yeah, well, uh, Jack actually lived with me for a period of time. Did he? Yeah. Yeah, he did. <laughs> but it's another story. So, um, I mean, 
yeah, he, he obviously came in on loan and at the time he was staying in a hotel and I was like, you know, he could sort of stay with me for a period of time. And for me, it worked out because, I mean, the club saved a bit of money. They would give me a little bit for him to stay with me. Um, so where, where were your digs or your house or your property at this point? Um, so at this point, I was renting a flat in um, Templars Court. So it's sort of on the way to Woolerton. Yeah. And um, yeah, so he would he stayed with me for a period of time, but Jack at the time was very a very young person, basically. Um, I'm not going to say naive, but he was perhaps. I mean, I remember one time he, I think I played a game with the under twenty threes, and he had an evening game, and I came back home, and everything, all the food was just just left out, and I kind of got bit angry at him to be honest and we fell out and I said you know Jack this can't be you know you, you, it's spoiled and I don't like this you know and he fell out and he didn't take too well to that at the time so um he then ended up moving out and then he went to to stay back in the hotel but he stayed with me for a I thought it was a couple of months two months three months something like that yeah um, you, were the, you were very much the domestic engineer was he Jack was more the takeout man pretty much yes we can put it that way I mean <laughs> I remember saying, can you please wash up the plates as well? And he's like, what? What am I doing? What? Washing the plates? <laughs> you know, sometimes uh, Premier League is different to, to League 2, League 1. <laughs> so, so, so um, there was another change. So, so, so Sean has come in. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think Greg had alluded to this, that yeah. it wasn't a great atmosphere just before Sean had come in. Yeah, you know, there were one or two divisions in the camp, and that those had clearly manifested themselves in not getting results. I the one very vivid memory I have is when we lost to Leighton Orient five nil. I think it was four or five nil. Dan at Orient was it a midweek? Yeah, Dan at Orient. Sorry, was it was it a midweeker? I think so. Yes, it was. Seemed to remember it's an evening. I was game. there. Oh, it was poor. Oh dear me, it was a bad one. Yeah. I and I remember, I remember Chris Kwame coming in the dressing room after, and I could just see in his face that he didn't know what to do anymore. He was sort of a bit of a, a bit lost, you know. How do I change this dressing room? How do I? And you know, they were falling out at the time in the dressing room as well. And you know, it's it's easy to start pointing the finger at people and start blaming each other. And um, but he was just, I could see at that time that he just didn't know what to do. And I think he actually got sacked. Um, short, very shortly after, I think that week or the next week it was, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, I think there was some story doing the rounds that they actually sacked him that night and then changed their mind for a week or two or something oh. like that. There was a story doing the rounds about that. But I think, mm -hmm. like, like you've just encapsulated there, I think kind of everyone knew the writing was on the wall at that point. Yeah, yeah. I think so. I mean, in terms of the dressing room, not to go into too much detail anyway, but it was just, there was a couple of the guys from um, from France who would be in their sort of more group. Um, and then there was the other guys, you know, like the leaders, really, Alan Sheehan. Um, I think, Judge, I don't know if Judgey was still there at the time. Um, Bish, I think Bish was still, I'm, so hard to remember who was there now, every, all the players, but there was like, I wouldn't say a divide really, but it was just perhaps not the most cohesive dressing room. Yeah. I mean, whenever there's factions within the camp, managers will always talk about getting the dressing room as united as it can be. Because fundamentally, yeah. fundamentally, you're only ever really going to have 11 people happy in the dressing room. Mm -hmm. That's the 11 that are playing. Because yeah. the you know, the person, the five on the bench, well, because everyone thinks they should play. Yeah. And one of the arts of management is trying to cajole and keep together as best you can a unit. But, you know, as one pro said to me, there's only ever going to be 11 players happy at best at any one time in a professional playing squad, just because mm -hmm. everybody thinks they should play. Yeah. Because if you don't think you should be playing, <laughs> you shouldn't be there, really, because you've got to have a certain belief in your ability. Yeah. And as and as harsh as harsh as it sounds, you know sometimes you never want the team to lose, but you you know you want the player not to do well. Really, who's in your position, basically, you know. 
it, it's real tough because it's obviously a team environment that you're in and, and you, you really want everyone to do well. But if they do well, then you're not getting back into the team. So it's, it's a real difficult atmosphere. And like you say, I think the best managers, you know, Pep Guardiola, the Klops of this world, they do that rotation and they know how to try and keep, I wouldn't say 100% happy, but maybe at least 70% happy. Uh, or fifty percent happy, maybe to a certain extent. You know, it's but it's a real difficult balance for for the manager. Um, so you spoke about the Oldham game, which you kind of knew where you would always get a game in the Johnson's paint. So you're out of that. Yeah. Um, Sean clearly has to do um, put his stamp on things and go down a certain route to try to reverse, if you like, the malaise or whatever it was. Mm -hmm. So we you effectively a casualty of that because obviously there's only one goalkeeping spot, isn't there? There's only one. And were there not many other opportunities? Cause you've said this to me before to play football, be it at under 23s or friendlies or whatever. Mm. I mean, I remember the, the pre-season when Sh Sean Derry came in. I mean, yeah, there was, the year he came in and then we got to the end of the season, we managed the great escape. And I sort of said this, right, you know, this is refresh for me and work incredibly hard. I remember what he said to me, he said, over pre-season, I just want you to run, basically. I didn't know why, as a goalkeeper, I need to run, but I just went, okay. So I just went running, basically. And I came back for pre-season, I was the fittest person there. But like I said from before, I always felt so much pressure to try i put so much pressure on myself to try and impress him paul and it was like every training session i went in i was I had extreme anxiety um i was suffering at the time now i look back you know i mean i was i was having suicidal thoughts to be honest with you I, i'm quite happy to share that because that's how it was you know i was driving back from training and i was like well you know i just didn't feel appreciated by anyone and to be honest um I feel like at the time there could have been a lot better communication. Like you don't go, in my opinion, from being a good player and a young prospect to overnight uh, or in the matter of a short space of time, just not being able to really even catch a ball or make any right decisions, which, which was happening to me. I mean, if you saw me in training, you'd be like, who's, who's this guy basically? Cause I was just, you know, I was sort of broken almost. Um, but no one ever came to me and said, what's up, Fabs? Like, you know, is there anything going on in your life? My dad had had a stroke as well around that time. So that was a personal matter, which was, which was difficult. And no one really said, you know, how can we help you? And I remember my stepdad calling me once and saying, can you meet me on the McDonald's on the A50? I don't know if you drive a lot on the A50, but he said, can you meet me there um, where the little chef roundabout is? And I was like, why? Is it something happened? It's like, no, no, I just, just want to have a chat with you. And um, anyways, I was like, right, okay. So I went, drove from Nottingham, drove to meet him there. And he just started saying, look, like, we need to get you some help. We need to get you a sports psychologist. And in my opinion, that's something that, you know, he had to pay from his own money to, to do that. In my opinion, that's something that as a, as a club, there's a duty or a responsibility where someone should you know try and initiate that from their end really i mean you know if you think as an 18 19 year old you think about mental well-being mental health i didn't know anything about that because it was never spoken back then you know this is six seven years ago we've only recently started speaking about mental well-being of of uh, of players and i didn't know what it was i was like right okay maybe you'll help me so i just went with that and there was a lot of sort of trauma in 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 my brain and, and yeah, different things that were just not allowing me to, to sort of perform. And, and it, yeah, it was, it was just something that I felt that the club, you know, at the time could have been done better. I could have been, you know, just asked, you know, how are you doing? What can we do to help or support you to get you back to where you were like a year ago or, or six months ago, basically. I mean, the, the, it is a subject of quite a bit of, debate within professional football at the minute mm. and i think that certainly at the elite level there are psychologists now full-time on, on on professional clubs rosters mm. um and i think that is filtering down yeah. through the levels of the game and i know that some clubs have a full-time psychologist uh, some will have access to where a psychologist would come in one or two days a week so i think the needle um 
is definitely moving mm. in the right way for that support that clearly during your time at the club, which would be six, seven years ago now, um, there was probably very, 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 very little access to it. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it wasn't really spoken about. I mean, it's not even, I don't even think it was perhaps, you know, having a sports psychologist, but just having a genuine care, perhaps, you know, as from one human to another, it's just like, you know, what's up, what's happening, why, why are you not performing? Again, it wasn't that spoken about. So, you know, I never blame anyone because it, sometimes you don't know any better, do you? I mean, again, I spoke about earlier, you know, it's a different time to what we were 20 years ago. And some people have grown up with, with that and that's fine, you know, but there's now a different generation of, um, of players coming through who have been brought up in different ways. And like I said earlier, you know, I come from a, from a well-rounded background and lived in different mm -hmm. countries internationally. And I've always been someone who doesn't need really, a, you know, shouting and screaming. I would rather have an arm around my shoulder and say, you know, how can we help you? And some might say, well, you know, if you want to become a professional footballer, you just need to deal with it. Others, you know, might say otherwise. It's just, again, it's, it's subjective perhaps, but I think there's, there's that need to, to help. And again, I, generally think if I would have had maybe a little bit more of, of support then could have been very different might not have been but perhaps it could have been and um, it then sort of later down the line as well I remember um, there was a time when when sort of Pilks played ahead of me I think as well in the game and I was like you know well, for me that, that that was tough to take um, and Sean mentioned in his interview as well about separating the you know, the dressing room to a certain extent, you know, this is the team that I'm working with, these I'm not working with. And I was never a bad egg. I worked, always worked extremely hard and tried my best. But the fact that my confidence was low, that's, I think, what put me in that camp, really, rather than the, the main camp. So, um, yeah, and I had many opportunities. I had many chances. I just never could, I could never sh show Sean what I was really about. It was just like a, a weight on my shoulders for some reason, because I felt like, Ever since that first game, I was just like climbing upwards, climbing a mountain. I couldn't get up it. So, so how did it all come to an end then? Um, At Knox? Yeah, so I mean, obviously then Sean left. And for me, another common thread of the club. And I think that's one of the challenges, you know, that when you have such a churn of managers, what mm -hmm. tends to happen is that gets reflected. Yeah. In an even bigger churn of players, in an yeah. even bigger churn, you know, and and whatever the challenges that Knots have had over a decade and more, mm. two decades, it's never been because they've only had 14 professionals. Never yeah. been that. Because they've had 36. Mm. You've got 36. What what do you do? That's 25 people like your 36 that are unhappy. Yeah. They are unhappy. And, that's been, and clearly a manager will come in. You'll say, I don't like those eight. I need another four to come in. The chances are you can't get rid of the eight. You might get rid of the two. So you bring four in. The squad's even bigger and more bloated. Mm. And, and that's been one of the real problems. And yeah. you're manifesting it here yourself now that you're having. You know, for me, at Knotts' level, from a financial perspective, you're better off having the 18 senior pros and then a pool of five or six young players yeah. that can challenge. Because while they won't necessarily accept not being playing, they will understand the situation more. They will understand the situation more. And for them, a place on the bench, you know, that's not too bad, you know. Mm -hmm. Whereas when you've got the 30 pros, you're going to have 10 senior pros that are used to playing. Oh, hang on, this, is, this club's a joke. Exactly, yeah. I, I think it... The more managers you have, the more the likelier you are to have one who you don't fit in with, basically. Of course, of course. Um, you know, I think that was, for me, that was just, I just, we didn't click with me and Sean. It was just, it was a difficult time for me. So, um, but yeah, we had way too many players at the club and there was people coming on loan and they were then training with this 
sort of, as we call it, the outcast group. Yeah, the bomb squad, squad, whatever you want to call squad, it. Yeah. yeah, bomb squad is now the, the euphemism that gets trotted out at every club. And from thinking, what is the bomb squad? It's kind of common language now. The, yeah. the reality is they've always existed. But it's never really been talked about too much before. Yeah, yeah. Well, we had players coming on loan and they were in that squad. So it's like, well, why are they coming on loan? It didn't really make that much sense. And, you know, at the time, I think we had a real... There's a good core of players and we had a good core of youth, basically. Um, you know, Hayden, Greg, Curtis, and see where Curtis is now. Um, Colby Bishop was there at the time as well, obviously taking a bit of time to develop. But there's a real good core of players there that the club could have sort of, you know, said, right, with this. I think um, Martin did, alluded to it as well about the philosophy of the... I don't know if it was Martin or Ricardo. It would have been Ricardo. Yeah. Ricardo talked a brilliant game about philosophy and DNA of the club. Yeah, the, the reality is you've got to win games, OK? Yeah, of course. With a promotion, relegation, right? You cannot have a bad season, right? You can't have a bad season. You are instantly under pressure. But yeah, he, he spoke very passionately mm. and that resonated with a lot of fans. Yeah, absolutely. But um, I mean, yeah, so just to go back to, I mean, then when Sean left, for me, it felt like, wow, this is like a weight lifted on my shoulders. And I remember coming back into training the next day and I was again, I was like, right, this is now my chance to impress him. Before that, I'd gone on loan to Bristol Rovers for a month where, again, things just didn't, they weren't going well. Um, again, it was, it was, I was living in a hotel for me by myself, so training and just wasn't, wasn't right for me at the time. Again, still having some, some problems um, mentally. So it didn't work out. But then when sort of Ricardo came, I was like, right, this is my chance now. But obviously he came in with, with six games to go. And I was like, right, I've got a chance here. So I remember going into training ball. I was pinging the ball left foot, right foot, making worldy saves here and there. Brilliant, back to normal. But at that time, I feel like the club had already made their decision. Basically, I don't know where it don't know where it came from. Whether it was from the uh, sort of the board or from uh, Ricardo making them decisions at that time. But I feel like I could have had maybe another chance. Basically, then that's and I, they said, you know. Um, I went on trial to Liverpool actually um, then as well. I'd have probably quite raised quite a few eyebrows. Um, but then, yeah, then uh, they, they let me go. And then I ended up going to Torquay, which was completely the wrong move for me. Um, yeah, let's that, that, that just c come back then. So, so Roy Carroll is in goal now. Yeah. And I think being realistic, Roy Carroll, if he's fit, as long as you don't sling a few in, is going to play. He was, superb. he was superb. He's going to play, let's be honest. And it is unlucky for you, right? That is going to be a difficult one for you to displace. Mm. Yeah? Very, Very yeah. difficult. Yeah? Absolutely. I guess if you're Ricardo, you're going to go with experience, you know, in that pressure cooker scenario of six games. You know, because we had the conversation. For me, his entire tenure revolved around the last five minutes at Gillingham. Yeah. If yeah. they stay up, it's fine. The moment you drop down a division, regardless of how much you put blame you could apportion to him for that relegation, it's a different set of results he needs to produce in the yeah. first three months of next season. And that that's how it played out. That's how it played out. I mean, that, I mean, that was a, a strange one for me to understand a little bit because obviously with Sean, it was a little bit more direct football and, you know, then Ricardo came in and it was like all of a sudden we're trying to pass the ball and play. Mm. And it was completely different for the players. Like, well, how do we change from this style to this style with six games to go in a relegation battle? It was like, wow, OK. I wasn't sort of saying in terms of playing. I mean, I, I knew Roy would obviously... You know, he had a magnificent time at the club. He was awesome. Some of the saves he pulled, I was like, this guy's like 38, 37, 38, whatever he was. I was like, it's incredible. He's getting down to these balls and I can't say, I wouldn't have been able to, to make those saves. But um, there were times previously when I was sort of still had my confidence where I could have gone on loan, but the club said no. And that was exactly. the time yeah. really where I should have been able to to go and play games. You need games, don't you? You need games at a decent standard as a young goalkeeper. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And that's what I didn't get, really. I was playing 23s, which is, 
it's not the same, you know. Okay. Um, and at the time, I was like, I need to go on loan for the club. Like, well, you're the number two. I was an 18, 19, 20 year old. Well, not when a developer's a number two. Either I play or <laughs> you're gonna, <laughs> you know, you're gonna lose, um, well, confidence, ability, whatever it might be. You don't get that experience that's necessary for for a goalkeeper. So you mentioned the, the loan, the, 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 the trial, call it what you will at Liverpool. So what happened there? Yeah, so um, Mick's always really backed my corner. Um, Mick, Mick Leonard, yeah. Mick Leonard, yeah. So he obviously um, t- took on the academy. He brought me to Notts in the first instance and he really helped me throughout my time. Obviously, he was a goalkeeper as well. And, yeah. you know, he always believed in me. That's what I, I really needed. I need someone to, to believe in me, basically. And he had that and he, you know, said right let's let's try and help you let's get you some trials here or there um and somehow Liverpool came up um because I think he had a, a contact there and you know they got me in for a couple of days and I did all right but again it was a very a very sort of surreal or different environment for three mm-hmm. days you go on trial it's difficult to make any real lasting impressions in a three-day trial so um uh, yeah that was, was a quick one basically but I mean, I was training with when Ricardo was there and I was doing well. Um, and I, I think that was a, a pivotal moment, to be honest, Paul, because, you know, the club could have said, right, we'll give him another chance, right? We'll give him maybe a reduced contract or something, but we'll, we'll give him another shot or have him, yeah, with us for a period of time. So were you, were eff- were you effectively released on that same fateful day or you know, morning or afternoon, whatever it was, as when Greg spoke about being released? Or were you the following? I think so, yeah, I think so. Um, and did it come I, as a surprise? No, it didn't come as a surprise. I was a, a little bit hopeful because I had done well in training since then. Um, but I remember other conversation when it was basically, you know, they were saying that you're not mentally tough enough. Basically, that was what was said. And my interpretation, I don't know what the interpretation of mentally being mentally tough is. Um, coping with setbacks or something but again you know when there's there's issues that people need support that's just how it how it is in my opinion I didn't really have that that support so um that's that's all really I I remember those words from the conversation um with Ricardo yeah Ricardo was there Pilks was there and I think Dave Dave Kevin was there as well um but yeah, then after that, it was actually, it was difficult for me to, to find a club, Paul. I was, I was actually perhaps at the time naive. Um, if I look back, maybe, I don't know, but I was a young goalkeeper who'd played, you know, 18, 19, 20, well, 20, I was 21 when I was released, played a couple of games at League One, had a bit of a name for myself. And I thought, well, you know, I should be able to find some other mm-hmm. club. In the league 21 is no age, especially for a goalkeeper. Exactly. But I think at the time, I mean, I went to a, I went to Torquay, Paul, and I signed for £125 a week. And this was with Paul Cox, who, of course, has connections with yes. Knox. He was down there on a short-term contract or whatever it was. Because Torquay obviously dropped out of the league and were finding it very difficult themselves, and even in non-league, yeah? Exactly. So, at the time, the, the sort of saying was, um, I didn't think it was the right move for me, but it was all that I really had. So, you know, yeah. do you wait? And I knew I was going to play at Torquay because I spoke to Paul and Paul knew who I was. Yeah. Um, so I was playing and then he obviously went with two, three months uh, into the season. Because um, I don't think he was getting paid, if I remember correctly. I don't know. Exactly yeah, they had, they, were they National League or did they drop to National League South at that point? No, National League they were. National League then, right. Okay. Yeah. They actually went down further after that. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, we had a minimal budget. It was a consortium that put, I think it was around 300,000 together for the season. And that's what essentially we were sort of trying to play on, basically. So yeah. we were in a relegation zone. We were above that. But then... Um, yeah, I think the promise to Paul was that if he does well, they'll, you know, sort of give him a certain deal or something. And that didn't quite materialise, I don't think. Um, so he then left. And then, again, Kevin Kevin Nicholson came in. Obviously, he was at, at Knotts and Kevin was a great person. But, you know, the wage I was on and going down and living, I was paying basically to live rather than getting paid. So I was using my savings to, to buy a, a little studio flat 
most of the lads were in bunk beds in the, in a house down there. I was like, I can't really do that. I, so I decided to, to do the best for myself to get a little studio flat and um, go off that. And, you know, there's only a certain period of time where you're like, you know, you, you start, it becomes a difficult situation. I was like, you know, I can't really stay anymore. And then they had a young lad as well, who Dan, who was coming through and he was doing pretty well. Uh, and I had one or two bad games at the time and they were like, well, we want to try and sell him on, which in the end they did. So they got a fee, but that's kind of how that worked at the time. So, so what happened after Torquay? So you, you came back to Nottingham then, didn't you? Uh, after Torquay, I went to Boston. Yeah. Uh, um, and but there's I, a few other Knots lads there, because Boston is quite a stamping ground for, for Knots players moving on sort of next tier down of non-league or whatever, yeah? Yeah. So I, this was then a move into semi-professional football, basically. So I was full-time at Torquay um, and then went to Boston to to play part-time. My flat in Nottingham, I couldn't rent it anymore, Paul, because I wasn't earning the wage. So I had to... Um, well, I, I bought a flat, basically, in Nottingham, and I had to rent that out then because I couldn't afford to live in it myself. Um, so then I was travelling from Stoke to Boston three times a week, which was a good two and a half hours, uh, which was fine. So I was, we were doing well because we were in the playoffs and we made the playoffs in the end. We ended up losing to Fylde, I think it was um, in the second leg, actually. We won the first leg quite convincingly. And then, at, uh, no, sorry, North Ferriby it was, North Ferriby. We lost to North Ferriby. Um, and, and then, yeah, I was like... They offered me a new deal at Boston, but I was like, you know, it's it's too far away from me to to travel two and a half hours. And then I went to Alfreton, yeah, um, where again it was a, pretty difficult because we weren't training. <laughs> Don't ask me why. Um, we I think in a year's time, Paul, we trained about twelve to fifteen times in a year. So that tells you something. So you know how to develop and. and go with that I don't know but I signed there um did did a year I think it was and then I went to Nantwich which was local to me here in in Stoke and played there for a couple of um one two seasons I really loved in my time at Nantwich actually it was a great little community club and was was doing well but then I had a quite a bad shoulder injury um which which kept me out for quite a period of time and then in the end you know, I came back, it's, it's one of those injuries that you just need a lot of ma maintenance and playing part-time and, and working as well. It became quite difficult for me to do both those things. Um, so I sort of said, you know, I'm going to sort of take a step back and, and go out of football um, for a period of time and, and, and leave it, basically. So, so what are you up to now, then? So now I work for a company called Athletes USA. So we essentially help um a lot of well athletes but also a lot of football players who were released um a young age to go and play in the american college system so it's uh for me that's a really rewarding uh role because you know about one percent two percent make it i obviously got a professional contract but then i was a prime example of falling out of football yeah. as well so for me it's it's great to for those players who get released and you know they struggle it's it, it is a struggle when you've fought for something all your life and you're trying to achieve something and then the club say sorry we don't want you you're not good enough or you're not tall enough whatever they say and for me the US is a great opportunity for them to get back on playing in a very good environment because the football I mean the facilities they have over there are absolutely incredible and um, the standard of football is is well, amazing and um yeah, it's for them a chance to to get back on and do a degree, but also play uh, a good level of football. And there's a lot of players now who go through college and go into the MLS afterwards. Mm. I mean, and, and I'm guessing that would have been a, a route trod by James Belshaw, who we had on the show uh, a couple of months ago, who's at Harrogate, who grew up as a mad Notts County fan, family, uh, and was in Notts County's Centre of Excellence, he got cut. He was released. I forget the age, and as then and, and then went to America, uh, and was in the same uh, alumni. I forget. I think he was at Duke, which is a big NBA basketball. Uh, as Mason Plumley, who plays for the Detroit Pistons, I think. But of course, James ended up getting coming back, got to Harrogate, and Harrogate, of course, have gone through 
the senior non-league setup, much to our, as we know from last year in, in the final. So he has he has finally achieved, you know, getting into the football league. Yours was kind of done at seventeen. Yeah, he's kind of gone a circuitous route. And it's taken him to the age of about 32 before he's been able to achieve his. Yeah, I played against James a couple of times. Um, so I, I don't know him personally, but I do know he's a, he's a good, very good goalkeeper. Always sort of stood out when I played against him. Um, I didn't actually know that he went to America. But again, it's a, it's a prime example that as well, when you are released at a young age, doesn't mean that it's the end. There are still further opportunities to, to then go back and, and play it at the highest level if that's what you want to do obviously I mean so, so how do you look back on your career now uh, how do I look back on my career um, I feel like it could have been very different but I don't ever have any regrets either because I'm I feel very happy where I am now um, in life in general um, obviously I'd always wanted to to play at the highest level and I sort of I really well I really wish it it have worked out with Notts County but um, things happen Paul you learn from them um, at a young age you you make mistakes which I certainly did um, but it's about again learning from them and then moving on basically um, I think so fond memories of Notts County I mean if there's one club that sticks in my heart it's definitely Notts County um, because of the, the times I had there and coming through the youth system and um, had some great experience. Obviously, I was on the bench at Liverpool as well, which was great. And the game at Wolves was was awesome. Yeah, no, I forgot to ask you that one. That was very much the, um, I guess, the high spot uh, of Chris Kawamia's managerial reign, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. We get the plum draw. We get the plum draw. Um, so that would have been Barting goal, I think, then, wasn't it? Yeah, I was, I was hoping because it was a cup game that he'd throw me in. <laughs> what, what was that like as an occasion and as a spectacle? Because obviously we were winning as well, weren't we? Yeah, I mean, Paul, I, I missed... I was. I always take ages to get ready in the dressing room. So I do all my tape, I take my fingers up and I have a long warm-up. And I was, when it, you know, everyone was... Obviously they were singing, you'll never walk alone. I was still in the dressing room. So I missed that bit. And I was like, oh my God, I came out and I was like, They've just they've just kicked off and I've missed it. <laughs> and then you just sat there on the bench and you're looking across and you see Mignolet and you see all the other guys and you're like, is this is this really happening? Sort of thing. Um, but it was like I I loved those big occasions. I really enjoyed like Wolves was was a big one. Obviously Portsmouth was a big one. My debut was big. But I would have loved to I think to have played in those games. Um, obviously everyone would have. Um, but I think I, I would have thrived in, in, in that sort of environment. Um, most players do, obviously, when you come up against the, the big guns, you, you up your game by 20, 20 30%. Um, but yeah, it would have been a great experience to, to play and come on. But uh, nevertheless, it was on the bench. I mean, we were in the hotel and you have your police escort as well to the, to the ground and all the fans are outside there. And you're like, wow, this is just... It, 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 I don't think it's sunk in yet, even. It's uh, one of those things. I mean, look, they are memories um, that you cannot buy. And, it, and in an incredibly cutthroat profession, you, you, you know, you are one of the top 1% of 1% of 1%, yeah, just to play one game. Um, and it's ultimately, um, you know, and I also think, speaking with some of the other lads on there, you have to let go as well. You know, whatever happened, happened, right? The good and the bad. But you have to let it go. You, you savour it and all the rest of it. But until such point as you let it go, you can't move on. You can't move on. You know, you have to get your mindset to the point where, right, okay, that's part of my life. And that was great. That wasn't quite so great. But you've got to go like that. You've got to look forward. You've got to look forward. 100%. Yeah, I, to I totally agree. And like I said, I mean, I don't have any regrets about anything. And uh, the hardest decision I ever made was, you know, to say, I don't, I'm, I'm not going to play anymore. But for the time, for me, that was the right decision to do. And I feel like that's when I sort of moved on. And I've, to be honest, as soon as I did, I felt a lot more relaxed, a lot calmer, I just mm. even probably say happier, you know. And I think Greg explained it as well. The thing is, when you go into professional football, it becomes intense 
and it's not like playing with your it's not like playing with your mates on a Saturday or a Sunday you know kicking a ball about it's your job so you know you have finances contracts pressure you know it it becomes a very difficult and hostile environment um, and some players can really cope with that and others you know they find it more difficult so I was one of those who found it more difficult yeah I, th I think that's a very um fair synopsis of it you know one of the reasons we do these podcasts um is 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 to give people who don't get ordinarily the chance to see inside the bubble mm. because the bubble is very very different to how people might imagine you know um you know i've worked with many managers um at leicester and you can physically see the toll it takes on them yeah you can physically see it and and and, and, and they lose their job, you say you goodbyes, you keep in touch, and three months later, they're different people again. They're completely different people again. And, and it, it, it's, it's not crying in far from it, because certainly at an elite level, you are paid huge sums of money compared to a nurse on the front, you know, or a, a frontline emergency service worker. Huge sums of money. So that's kind of the quid pro quo with these things. Um, and as Greg has mentioned, you've mentioned, um, you know, professional football is incredibly difficult. You know, at 17, you've potentially got the world at your feet, haven't you? 17 minutes under your belt, uh, 17, uh, 18 years old, Manchester United in the sun, etc. But it's kind of an example of those fine, fine, fine margins that are out there. My, you know? my biggest mistake, Paul, was I became Fabian the footballer rather than Fabian as a person. And when you solely relate with who you are as a footballer, the bad times hit you 10 times harder. So that's all you know. You know, I'm just, you know, you win a game, you're happy, you lose a game. It's the worst thing in the world. If you have, you know, an identity outside of sport as well, you know, that helps because when those bad times hit, well, you can relate to another side of you, you know, have other hobbies, your family, that side of thing. But if your football's all consuming, it just becomes incredibly difficult. And this is why you see so many players, you know, drugs, gambling, mental health problems, because that's, they're, they're, they're the footballer and your friends are asking you about football and sometimes your family asking you about football. And all you know is it's, it's football, football, football. And, you know, in football, you probably have more bad times than good times. And, you know, like I said, it just hits you like a ton of brick wall. Uh, when, when the bad times come, relegation, whatever it might be, it's, it's tough. So I, you know, I really, what I should have done was when I got my professional contract was carry on with an education. I remember I was just going home, sitting there, I need to rest. Right. You know, this is it. Go back to training tomorrow. And people say that works for some, it might do. Uh, and to just have total tunnel vision focus for me that I don't think that's the right way to approach it because, um, you know, the tunnel can sometimes be a really long way away and you just can't find the end. So it's just important to have, other avenues to to go into as well other hobbies identities that you can explore whilst playing football because you have the time at the end of the day um so you want to try and soften the blow when you lose and, and when you lose a contract or whatever it might be what, what age are you now turning 27 on monday do you play at all now no i haven't played. do you miss it i miss sides of it yes um and others not so much so um i do want to try and play again but again probably just on a saturday sunday uh, i haven't got to it yet with covid primarily since i stopped playing a lot of this it has been covid um but i do want to to get back playing just remember it like when i was a kid <laughs> playing with your friends on a saturday or on a on a Friday evening, whatever it was. I mean, when I was young, I played till 12 in the evening. It was just the best thing ever. Um, to try and get that back, that love, I think, uh, for it. Yeah, because there, there, there has been quite a lot of research produced with players that come through an academy system. Mm. That when inevitably, and I say inevitably based on percentages, 90%, probably more of those people that go through academy systems from the age of seven, eight or nine. It's actually a large proportion of those people who are released. You would think, well, blimey, you know, they've had, they've had five years of playing pro. They must be, they must be all right to be at least at that standard compared to someone else that's never been inside a pro club ever. Yeah. yeah. 
Mm. But there's a heck of a lot of them don't even want to, don't even want, not so much whether they're good enough, don't want to play. Don't want to play. It's, it's so structured. And as a young age, you have to enjoy playing football. But, you know, academies assign kids at the age of six now. Can you imagine, you know, playing football at the age of six? It's just, you have to do this, you have to do that. You, you know, you just can't, it's so structured, you can't express yourself. And it's not, in my opinion, it's not the right way. The best players, I think, you know, the, they play three or four or five different sports up until they're about 13, 14, because they get all the skills from those different sports. And then they can combine it into football and specialise in that. Um, but, I mean, yeah, it's, it's a difficult environment. You know, you see kids being released at 10, 11, it breaks their heart. They work so hard for it. And someone says, well, you're not tall enough. Sorry, we don't want to take you. I can understand why they don't want to play beyond that. It's so difficult for a child to take. But what is good is, you know, you can look at your number 23 shirt in the background, winning League One. Um, you've got a lot of memories, camaraderies among those groups of people, you know, with Greg and those. And, and you know, and, and, and someone who you mentioned in your same year, Curtis, has gone on to have a longer career in, in, in professional football. And, you know, it's very good that you've come to terms with yeah. where you are, where you've been, and most importantly, where you're now going to go to. Exactly, yeah. Like I think you said it earlier, it's just about learning from the process and moving forwards rather than looking back and what could have been. I don't, I don't have that, to be honest. And I think this call was a bit too, you get perhaps maybe a little bit of closure as well, just to explain my experience and what happened and, um, you know, just talk about the difficult side of football that not many people talk about but needs to be spoken about because that's important for the younger generation who are coming through the system. Um, you know, who struggle as well and for them to to know that it's okay to ask for help or for them to understand what, you know, if you're going through a difficult patch, you know, speak to someone at the club or speak to your family and you say, look, I'm going through a difficult time. What can we do? How can I, how, how can you help me? Or, you know, I mean, football's moved on since then, but there's still cases like that out there. So um, very, very important. And yeah, I mean, I look forwards now. I don't look back. I, I love my time at the club. Um, learned so much from being a footballer like I said I don't have any regrets whatsoever um, and it's it's given me a great foundation to to sort of move forwards now. I think on that very positive note let's end it there Fabian thank you very very much indeed it's been a very illuminating chat and I think it's important as well that we talk back to players from the Jurassic era when I was a lad but it's also, we, we, we talk to the younger players, you know, because you will, you know, you'll be paying for my pension in years to come. Well, I hope you will anyway. You'll be earning the money that, you know, gives me a pension. So, um, you know, it's important that we look through the lens of lots of different people. And that lens isn't necessarily about a 55-year-old who has made 327 appearances when Notts County were always in the Premier League and the Championship or the top two division equivalents of that era and it's just as important for us to learn and understand about someone who's who's in his 20s who who was there for two three four years as a pro but there's still an awful lot of stories and experiences that you can take away and tell 100 percent, totally agree yeah uh, i mean football's different now to what it was before and i think again it's moved on and we just it's important that we all speak and you know it's always there, the the top ones that get the limelight which which is fine but it's the, the unheard stories which can sometimes have the biggest impact on others i think fabian thank you very much indeed thank you paul